And so let's just pray real quick, Father God. We ask, Lord, that you quiet the room, Father. Drive out every spirit in this room, Father, that will hinder everybody from hearing your voice into the deepest depths of their heart, Father. This message, Lord, is a life changer. And Father, I know the enemy is not going to want people to hear it. So he's going to project distractions all through this message. Lord, I'm asking that you cover the room. You cover the room, Father. And you do what you need to do to make sure that your people, your children, hear your voice. And Father, we thank you, love you, and praise you, Lord. In your precious name we pray, Father. Amen. 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 So, on Thursday evening, I, I love putting feelers out on Facebook. And one of those feelers was that God had been speaking one word to me all week long. And, and I bet you everybody's been going, I wonder, I, I know what that word is. I know what that word is. I bet you don't know what that word is. All right? Because God speaks a lot of words to me. So I'll reveal that word in a little bit. But first I need to, to, to speak to you a little bit about a secret. And it's the secret of your life. So please turn us to Colossians 3 with me. It's Colossians 3, 1. Now, if you remember last week, we used this same verse. And I was kind of like, God, what are you doing? You're giving me a rerun here. And he goes, no. He goes, I'm giving you a different definition. And I love that because one of my statements Friday night was, if you become so familiar with the Word of God that you read a sentence and you don't find something different in it, shame on you. Because every time I read the Word of God, I, I, a new definition of that sentence or a sentence is revealed to me. Alright? The Word of God, when you read it, and it all depends on what you're going through in your life, defines moments that you are going to need to hear what God is saying in his word. And it will not be the same all the time. Okay? But if you become familiar with the word of God, John 3, 16, for those who love the world, da -da 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 -da, you know, nobody will stand before the Father unless they go through me and the Son. All right? And so we read that, and all of a sudden it's like, well, yeah, that's just what it means. No. There's amazing definition in that short, small sentence. And, and, and actually, if you were, to, if I was to have you actually write that out and make you think about it for a month, think about that one sentence for a month, and then have you write down what was given to you, if you allowed the Holy Spirit to speak to you, you would have a page and a half. Because it's not just receiving Christ to stand before God. There's so much more. So Colossians 3 1 says, So it comes down to this, and I, I'm reading it out of the voice. I'm using my NIV, but I took this quote out of the voice Bible. Since you have been raised with the anointed one, since you have been raised with the anointed one, the anointed one being God. Now, when I say being raised, at the time of salvation, you began a new life. All right? A new life was given to you. The old life was dead and passed away. So you have been, since you received Christ, raised with God. I want you to understand that. Because so many of us tend to say, well, you know, I can't help it because I am who I am. No, 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 no. When you received Christ and you were saved, you became a new creature. A brand new creature. You became born again. All right? I need, you to, I need you to write that down. Born again. The liberating king, he liberated you from a sin nature, from death, and gave you new life. Okay? The old has passed away. But we continue to constantly live in the old. Because, well, that's what we do. 
because we don't come to the understanding that everything is new from the day we gave our life to Christ. Everything became new. Set your mind on heaven above. So, so I, I've, been, I've been training myself to think eternal thoughts. Everything that I do must have a purpose in eternity or it's a waste of my time. Amen. Okay? Everything I do must have an eternal purpose. Because if it doesn't have an eternal purpose, it's temporal. And that means that it will pass away very shortly. So I must have an eternal mindset. So my mindset must be on those things that are of the heavenly. Alright? So remember that. My mindset must be on the heavenly. The anointed one, Jesus, is there, seated at the right hand of God. Stay focused on what's above, not on earthly things. Because your old life is gone, dead and buried. So if I hear somebody saying, I can't help it, it's who I am, then you have never received the new life, and you're still living in something that should have been dead and buried long ago. Because it's gone. It's gone. It's not there anymore. Amen. Unless you decide to live in it. Amen. I did this message called Riding the Dead Horse. And, you know, it's really kind of funny. And I didn't plan on going here, but I'm going to go here anyways. Because I can. You have this horse. You love this horse. This horse is a majestic horse. One day the horse dies. And you have to bury the horse. And so you dig a big, huge grave, and you put this horse in it, and you, you know, bury it, and, you know, somebody brings a new horse to you. And you look at the new horse, and you go, oh, that's a pretty horse. But I miss the old horse. So you grab a shovel, and you go out, and you, you dig up the old horse. And you put it up there, and you mount your saddle on it, and you get on it, and you dust the dirt on it, and you go, yeah! <laughs> and you ride that dead horse. Except you're just sitting there making the movements because the horse ain't moving because it's dead. Come on now. It can't go any further. It's in one place. And so then all of a sudden you go, well, that was nice. And you put the horse back in the grave and you bury it all back up. And, you know, you're going, oh, I'll ride the new horse the next day. And then you go out to the barn, you look at the new horse and the new horse is still sitting there. And, and you go, well, oh, it's a nice horse. And you pat it. And, but you go grab your shovel and you dig up. You know, the old horse, and you pick it back up out of the grave, and you prop it up, and now you got to tie, you know, because Ring of Mortis is still setting in on it. And so now, all of a sudden, it's sitting there, you put your saddle back on it, you try to brush, and clumps of hair and ick are coming off of it, and you sit on the horse, and it makes like a noise, because it's just turning the splotch, and all of a sudden, you're on it, and you go, yeah. And it's making squishy noises. Oh. <laughs> but that brand new horse is sitting there, and it's, you know, if the horse could talk like Mr. Ed, hey, ride me. I'm a, I'm a gallant steed. I have tons of new life in me. I'm, I'm, I'm ready to run and gallop and trot and jump and do all this stuff. And you go, huh. And you even grab the saddle and you look at the new horse. And then you put the saddle down and you go out. And you grab your shovel. Wow. And you dig. <laughs> it's getting bad now. And you're digging out the horse. And now you can't pick the whole horse up. Because now it's like sludge. And you're, you're picking up pieces of the horse. And you're attaching it. <laughs> and, and you're doing this. And then you take your saddle. And you throw it up on, and, and it kind of settles way down low and just kind of goes boom. And you get on the horse, and by now your knees are touching the ground, because it's a sway back now. I mean really sway back now. And you're on it, and you're going, yeehaw. And 
And so then you shovel the bits of the horse up, you pour them in the grave, and you bury it back up. And a friend comes over, and he pulls his horse out of the trailer, and he goes, let's go for a ride. I'd love to see you ride the new horse. And you go, well, I've not ridden the new horse yet. And he goes, why? He says, because I'm afraid to. But I'll go riding. And he grabs his shovel. <laughs> and he begins to dig up the old horse. And his friend goes, you know, I gave you the new horse as a gift. All you have to do is ride. How many of us have been given a gift of a new horse and we never ride it? We never ride the horse. We never take it out of the stall. We never put it to work. Remember that story? <laughs> because your old life is gone, dead, and buried. Your new life, the new horse, is hidden in Christ. The new horse is hidden in Christ. Take it out of the stall and run. You see, that's what happens, as we'll find out in this message. We are so afraid to ride the new horse. I, I personally have no idea why, except that we keep wanting to grab that shovel and dig that old horse out. Well, pretty soon that old horse is going to become super. And you're never going to be able to ride it. And then what are you going to do? So your new life is hidden. In the Hebrew, hidden means made a secret. To be hidden within and enmeshed with the anointed one who is God. Enmeshed means to be entangled in. Entangled in. Which means you can't get out. Once you receive Christ, you can't get out. You're entangled in. You need to take the life that Christ has given you, that he has become interwoven into and walk in it. And walk in it. You see, there's, there's this amazing thing, there are these amazing things that keep us from living in that. Colossians 2.20, and if you want to turn there, you can, since we're already in Colossians, tells me, and I love this, that I have died with Christ to the elemental spirits of the cosmos. What does that mean? I have died to what is weaving around in the air around me. Those spirits of, of, of deceit and everything, <coughs> lies, fear, depression, anxiety, all those things. I have died to the elemental spirits of the cosmos. They have no more reign over me. They have no more reign over you. Why? Because you are hid in Christ. When you are hid in Christ, they cannot seek you out. They cannot find you unless you go out, get the shovel, and keep burying, unburying the old man. And you expose it. You expose it. Last week we talked about keeping the temple full. And, and a lot of you came up to me afterwards and said, Pastor Mark, I never thought about that that way. Moses could not enter the temple because the temple was so full of the Holy Spirit, he could not enter in. The temple is your heart. We talked about that last Sunday. If it's full, nothing can enter in. But on top of that, nothing can enter in because you are hid in Christ. Unless you've never understood the word hid in. When we were kids, we used to love to play hide and seek, and I was good at it. I could hide for hours. 
And I did. One day we were playing hide and seek, and I hid for like six and a half hours. Nobody could find me. That's what being hidden in Christ is. Do you believe you're hidden in Christ? Do you believe that nothing can touch you unless you let it? I have died to Christ to the elemental spirits of the cosmos. Then why do we constantly submit to the rules of this world if we do not even belong here? Think about that. We're visitors. We, we, nothing in this world has rule over us. Nothing in the elemental spirits of the cosmos have rule over us. Because we don't even belong here. Do we follow the laws of the land? Yes, we do. But notice I said the laws of the land, not the laws of the air. It's the laws of the air that we keep falling into. That derive the sin nature from us, from the natural man. I know some of you are going, what did he just say? The more I worship the air, the more I fall prey to my sin nature. When we talked about idol worship about five weeks ago, I can't even remember what day it was. We said we're not worshiping the idol, we're worshiping the demon in the idol. So now we're demon worshippers. And we do the same thing when we begin to, to become unhid in Christ. We allow the elemental spirits of the cosmos to affect us and bring us to those things that we are trying not to be in. I hate it when somebody says, I have a sin nature, I can't help it. No, you do not have to live in it. You don't have to give rein to it. That's your decision. You do not have to give rein to sin in your life. Take a stand, be hidden Christ, and say, I do not accept this as a standard of living. That's right. Yeah. Come on now. Did you know that the phrase in Christ is used over 99 times in the New Testament? 99 times we are hid in Christ. And the phrase, listen and obey, are over 75 times. So, it's got to be important to this. It's got to be important to God that we understand this. Listen and obey and live hid in Christ. So, here it is. Pastor Mark, I'm struggling with this. Why? You're hidden Christ. You're hidden Christ. Why are you struggling with this? Well, because I don't know what to do. Listen and obey. Listen and obey. But see, the problem is, is we don't want to listen and obey in today's society. We want to go to every self-help book and everything else, and we'll, we'll get information from that. But I'm telling you what. This is the best self-help book you'll ever find. Amen. And if you can't listen and obey and be hidden Christ, I hate to tell you, anything secular is a waste of your time and it ain't going to work. Secular counseling does not work. Because they want to tell you you weren't breastfed and they want to go down and blame your mother and father for all the problems you got. And that ain't it. Yes, there was a root that was started that began a generational curse. But generational curses do not have to run through families. Because you are hidden in Christ and you need to listen and obey. Now Mark 16, 19. It talks about when Jesus ascended into heaven. What happened when Jesus ascended into heaven? Now remember, we are hid in Christ. I need you to understand this. This is a big part of this. You are hid in Christ. 
Repeat that. I am hid in Christ. Say it again. One more time. Alright, so now you know you're hidden in Christ, but you need to say it 70 more times, and I don't have time for that right now, because I need to keep going in the message, or else we'll be here till 3 o'clock, and some of you guys are going to be going, oh my God, I've got to sit in these chairs for three and a half more hours. You are hid in Christ. <clears throat> So when Jesus, Jesus ascended into heaven, he, he sits at the right hand of God. What does that mean? What does that mean, sitting at the right hand of God? It means a place of honor. A place that holds great authority. Where are you? In Christ. What? In Christ. Hidden in Christ. Where are you? At the right hand of God the Father. What does that give you? A place of authority and honor. Do you know that when you say the Lord's name, every demon trembles and runs? Why do you live in a sin nature that's driven by demons? Say the Lord's name. Say it, Jesus Christ. Say it again. Say it one more time. All right, now I'm feeling like I'm... I'm going, going all Baptist and Pentecostal all over there. Yeah. You are hidden in Christ. And because you are hidden in Christ, the demons flee. You have authority and you are honored by God and they have no power over you. Amen. I'm wearing another shirt under this. I may have to take the top one off. Philippians 4.8 tells me, finally, brothers and sisters, oh, I love this, fill your mind with beauty and truth. Not that crap you're on the internet on, not that crap that you're looking at if you're going to a club, not that crap that you're, you're, you're filling your minds and hearts with, but the beautiful things and truth. But Pastor Mark, I'm a sinner. No. You're a redeemed believer. Amen. You are hid in Christ. Amen. Nothing has reign over you. I, I, I loved I loved it because because Curtis's son, Christopher, his wife had an issue. And and she was rushed to the hospital. And they found out that she had a little heart attack. All right. And, and so I, the minute Curtis got a hold of me, I got on the phone to call Chris. I'm, I'm dying. I mean, I'm, I'm literally dying. I caught whatever this strange, weird freak show bug that's going around. And, 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 I, and, and I go, I go to Crystal. I go, I got to call Chris. She goes, how are you going to do it without gagging and coughing? I said, I got to do it. And so I got on and I said, Chris, let's pray right now. I said, because nothing is going to have rain over this. And I'll tell you what, we did a lot of praying last week. Because a lot of people went down. It was like a prize fight in this church. And people were getting knocked out all over the place. But we kept praying them up. And, and Christopher said, God reigns over this. God reigns over this. You know what's so cool about that? He gets it. He knows he sits at the right hand of God. Because see, when we're hidden Christ, we are hidden Christ at the right hand of God the Father. Place of honor and authority. You gotta learn to live in that. In that honor and that authority. Fill your mind with beauty and truth. Meditate. On whatever is honorable. Who sits at the right hand of God the Father? Jesus. Who is honorable? Jesus. And so my thoughts become thoughts that are on Christ. I look at people and I wonder what I can do that Christ would do. 
I wonder how I'm going to do something that is going to honor Christ in my actions. In my actions. Meditate on whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is godly, whatever is virtuous, and praiseworthy. Well, that only describes one thing, and his name is Jesus. Amen. Amen. Whatever you learned, heard, and received by listening, apply it now. You see, that's one of the biggest problems. We listen, but we never apply. And then we wonder why our lives are in shambles. And we wonder why we can't defeat this dark cloud over our lives. Because we never apply the word. We never apply the word of God. It's great to sit here and listen. And it's great to say, oh, I got that scripture. I'm writing that scripture down. It's great to take all of the notes in the world. I got notebooks upon notebooks of notes that I took in, the, in all the different times that I spent under pastors. But they're notebooks. They're notebooks. Until I put them in action. And I begin to live by what is written in those books. Amen. If I never put it into action, it's just a book. It's just a book with a nice leather cover on it, with some tabs on it that keep falling out, with a bunch of highlighter marks and notes in it. It's just a book. But when I put it into action, it becomes the word. It becomes the truth in my life. It becomes everything and anything that I will ever need. When we apply the word, God begins to walk with us. And we are blessed with the blessings of the family. We spoke a little bit about this Friday night. If you miss Friday night, Friday nights are intense in here. Wednesday nights are intense in here. The fix is growing. Um, when we walk with God, all right, now, the Word of God tells us that if children obey and honor their parents, they will be blessed. In, in their futures, all right? They, they get the blessings bestowed upon them from the family. We sit at right hand of God the Father. We are part of the family. Until you begin to apply the word of God, you will never reap the blessings of the family. That family is God the Father, Jesus Christ the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The reason we struggle with things is we've never applied the word correctly to our lives and we never reap the blessings of the family. Instead, we reap the, the curses from the generational curses of the family. There has to be a place where we apply the word and we stop the generational curse. Amen. There has to be. There has to be, it has to be found. And the only way to do that is to apply what God has spoken to your life. Why? Because our lives are hidden in Him. Do you know what it is going to be like being represented in the glory of Christ when He returns? The full revelation of who we are will be revealed in Christ. Nothing hidden. Nothing. The full revelation of who you are will be revealed in Christ. No more sin, no more fear, no more doubt, no more nothing. Just glorified you standing with Christ. John 14, 1 through 3 tells me this. Do not get lost in despair. Believe in God and keep believing in me. My Father's home is designed to accommodate, now listen to this, all of you. 
Now, here's a funny thing. If there were not room for everyone, I would have told you. Well, that just shot down everything the Calvinists believe. Because the Calvinists believe that God picks and chooses people to go to heaven. But see, the Word of God tells me that there's room for everybody. Amen. As a matter of fact, the Word of God tells me that every tongue will, or every ear will hear about who I am before I come back. That's right. Well, you listen up now. With technology that we have today, all right, I put out 10,000 texts every single morning, and I know those texts are getting put out to everybody around the world. The Facebook keeps getting hit constantly. We're up around 8, 9, 10,000, 11,000 hits on that. I, I got a counter on the back side of my Facebook page. You don't even have to like it. You just got to view it, and I know you've been on the page. Right. Every ear is already heard about who Jesus Christ is. I'm telling you that. Technology has made it possible. Yeah. What does that mean? Uh-oh. Uh-oh. It means any time God so chooses, he can come back. Amen. So we got to quit flub dubbing around and apply the word of God and live in the places that he has called us to be and be hid in him and quit screwing around with saying, I'm just a sinner, God, and that's the way I am. <laughs> because his word says no. No. Romans tells me you do not have to live in the sin nature, but if you want to, that God will give you up to your perverse desires. So if you like it, have at it. Personally, I want to be hidden Christ. I want to be hidden Christ. I am hidden Christ. And because I'm hidden Christ, I have been given power and authority over the demons. Amen. And so they have to flee when I mention his name. So there's room for everyone. So if God doesn't pick and choose, and this is going to hit you right in the nerve bucket, <laughs> then why do I? Why do I get to pick and choose who hears about Jesus Christ? Wow. God doesn't pick and choose because there's enough room for everybody. But because we go, oh, I can't tell them about Jesus because they'll think I'm some kind of a freak. Yeah. It's so funny because Terry was out here, and I, I didn't really tell everybody, but we had like 200 and something people on the parking lot Thursday night because the Good Shepherd food truck showed up. And so Terry decided to grab a bunch of those little hope cards over there. And she went down the line giving people hope cards and grabbing food stuff for them and running it to their car. And she's throwing cards out left and right. And it's just what we do. If you haven't taken some of those cards, take them. They're amazing. Everywhere I go, I got a, I got a stack of them, and I'm giving them away. Hey, check this out. You know? Because you don't get to choose who goes to heaven. And if you do choose, then you get to stand there and explain why you didn't tell him. See? That's application of the word of God. You have been called to reveal the life that you have been given. Hallelujah. I'm going to make arrangements for your arrival. I will be there to greet you personally and welcome you home. You know where I'm going and how to get there. Now, in Isaiah 48, 1, we've been doing Isaiah on Wednesdays. This all fits together, by the way. You're probably going, man, he's flopping around like a, like a Mexican jumping bean. But Isaiah 48, 1 says, and now listen. Isaiah 49, 1 says, listen. Isaiah 51, 1 says, listen to me, all you who are serious. Ooh, listen to this. All you who are serious 
about living right. Because you know what? If you don't want to listen, it means you're not serious. You really don't care. You love wallowing in sin. You love wallowing in despair. You love wallowing in anxiety. You love wallowing in depression. You love wallowing, wallowing in the addictions that you have. You love wallowing in filth, crap, garbage, junk, whatever. Listen if you're serious about living right. And then apply the word of God. Oh, but pass them on. I don't know how. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. Live in the way of the Lord. We don't listen. And we don't obey. And we stop looking at God. Why? Doubt. The phrase, but now, appears many times in the New Testament. The words now denote a change in plans. So remember that. The words, but now, denote a change in plans. It means something that was going to be nevermore. Because we are now going to change it. Please go to Romans 6.22. But now, but now, it's always funny because after but now, it's usually but now listen, but now change, but now apply, but now walk in the glory of God. Stop, but now means it's time to change something, stop living in the way that you were, because that's a cop out. Pastor Mark, I can't stop living in the way I was living. Why? I don't know. It's because you don't trust God. How's that? Amen. You don't trust God. It all boils down. You're not trusting God, not handing over, not handing everything over to Him, and walking in the glorified life that He has called you to walk in. Amen. Let's not let's not BS anybody about this. Bad stuff anybody about this. <laughs> We've chosen not to. We've chosen not to because we are comfortable. It's almost like a little baby loves being in a poop-filled diaper because it's warm until it gets cold. And that's what we do. We sit there and sit there and sit there wallowing and wallowing and wallowing in it when there's an easy escape. Let it go. Amen. Let it go. Everybody sings that stupid song from that from that from that dumb Disney movie. Let it go. You know? Let it go. Why are you holding on to it? I have come to give you life to the abundance. Amen. Do you not want abundant life? I love living in, in abundant life. I can, I, I mean, every day I wake up going, where are we going today, God? Where are we going? And then I run downstairs and I fill the temple so full that nothing can penetrate it. Because I know the minute I allow something to penetrate my temple, it's all done. <coughs> But now, but now, Romans 6.22 says, you have been em emancipated, separated from, let go, cut free, turned loose from the death grip of sin. Amen. So for those of you who think you need to live in it, Romans 6.22 says you know. And are God's servants. You have a different sort of life. The words now denote a change. A change in life. 
A life of holiness rather than sin. The power of sin is minimized due to a change in your heart. It has no more reign over you. Because why? Your heart has been transformed. Now, unless your heart hasn't been transformed, then sin has reign and dominion over you. But the minute you receive Jesus Christ, sin has no more reign or dominion of you over you. The things of the past are put away. You no longer have to live in it. It's your choice on whether you want to or not. Romans 7, 7 24. We go from Romans 7, 24 of being miserable in sin to being changed. Why? Because we've been set free. Listen. We now have been given freedom through Christ. We are no longer defined by a diagnosis or a label which is derived by a sin nature or a natural man indication. And everybody in the room just went, what? what? We are no longer defined by a diagnosis or a label which is delivered by a sin nature or a natural man indication. Because natural man wants to tell you what you are and keep you what you're in because the enemy runs the natural man society. And he wants to keep you down thinking you need to live in a label or a diagnosis or whatever it is you need to live in. But my word, the word of God says to me, you are free Amen. from all things. You have been set free. But now, but now it's time for a change. But now life has been changed. Quit living in the past. Amen. Live in the future of Christ. You're going to love this next part. We are defined by the change that comes from a life committed to Christ. A life that is 100% dependent on Christ. Pastor Mark, my life's in the shambles. Now, let me tell you something. We were supposed to close on a house nine months ago. And, 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 and it's just, the enemy keeps throwing stuff because he doesn't want us in that house. It's just the way it is. Praise God. Hallelujah. Amen. And so, you know what? We've just been going, hey, amen. Praise God. Well, you know, like I said last Sunday, we threw the fleece out there. We decided to start looking at other houses. And right after we prayed, I said, Lord, if this is in the house you want, then you know what? Open something else out. If it is, then you need to have Joe call us right off the bat. Within five minutes, the mortgage guy called and said, you're approved. Boom. Now, through this whole time, my poor wife, I love my wife, because she's got this stuff she wants up on the wall yes. and stuff done, and I'm going, I'm not unpacking a box because we're moving again. <laughs> For some reason, God's not moving in this exact moment right now. Well, I know why, because the finance rate went way, way down, and we caught it, so that was really good. All right. But I said, I'm not doing this until. That's right. Because... I'm not repacking everything that we packed. So we'll leave it in boxes until we get okay. Okay? <coughs> so, I went, aha. Uh -huh. Meanwhile, my wife is saying, we ain't going nowhere. We ain't going nowhere. Go over the face. Yes. <laughs> she, she did. She, she keeps saying that. And I keep saying, when my name is on the line, it's my house. Because, because you look, God never settled the temple. He made it portable so they could pick it up and move it. So I was just kind of saying, God, is this where you want us to settle? You know? 
but I'm trusting you 100% for whatever you do. Right. I'm not going to get angry, upset, anything. I'm just going to say, all right, Lord, hallelujah. And people are going, how can you be so happy through this? Because I belong and am hid in Christ. Amen. And nothing of this world is going to frustrate me, captivate me, and bring me to a place where I deny my life in Christ. Period. Many say God's got this, but never truly hand everything over to him. Isn't that funny? So how can you say it when you won't let it go? See, that's because of a movie. God's got this. God is good. But we don't believe it. And we don't hand everything over to him. <coughs> it's when you hand everything over 100%. Then you can say, God's got this. That's right. Because you've given it to him. That's the only way you can say that. Don't say it unless you really have given everything over to him. Because that's a lie. You're lying to God. God. God's got this. And God's going, what do I got? You haven't given me anything. What are you trying to give me? And instead, you've got to stuff down in one of your pockets. And you're not giving it to him. No. Say God's got it when you've given it to him. Because then it's his. It's not yours. If you're still struggling with something, it's still yours. It's not his. I'll never forget the day I handed over the drugs, the alcohol, and everything else all on the same day. I said, God, it's yours. It's not mine. He said, give it to me. Jump in my arms. Here we go. And I did. And I've never gone back to it. Ever. Ever. I remember the day Corey did. In that jail cell. He's never gone back to it. Amen. Ever. Amen. You gave it to him. And every day she gives it to him. Amen. Not I, but Christ who lives in me. Amen. It's not yours. You're hid in him. The words hear and obey in the Hebrew are shoha. In Deuteronomy 6, there's a prayer that Jesus and the Jews of old used to say every day. And a lot of the Jewish people say it today. I have a good friend that's a rabbi, a born-again Christian rabbi in Israel. And I texted him last night and I said, is this prayer still said? And he said, yes, it is. And I said, I just wanted to confirm that before I bring it out in the message because I always want to be transparent and truthful. And here's what it says. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God. The Lord alone. You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your might. Now, in the Hebrew, that means a physical activity. A physical activity. All right? Which means we every day will hand our lives over to the Lord. Remember when I told you in the morning you go to get the temple filled? Every day you hand your life over to the Lord. It's a physical activity. All right? You hand it over. You go before the Lord. You physically open the word. You fill your temple with the word of God. But in Greek and Western culture, it stresses a mental activity. So you must first mentally be aware that you have to go in to your place and read the Word of God and put it into the temple. So the mental activity stimulates the physical activity, and then we proceed forward and we mentally go, I have to do this, and then we physically do it. One does not work without the other. <clears throat> One does not work without the other. Because I have to bring myself to that mental place where my heart is correct before God, my mind is in the correct disposition, and I am now physically going to fill what I need to fill my temple by using my eyes physically to read the Word of God and apply it to my heart. <clears throat> 
We need to focus to listen. Trust, which is batash, which means to feel secure in, and acknowledge is yada, which means to know in its entirety without question. So we first must begin with a mental activity of focusing. Then we go to the physical of applying. And then we do and we acknowledge which will make us feel secure in its entirety and not question it. And apply which is pronounced sabab, which means to be surrounded by all sides and in. That's application. Whenever a fort was being or a town was being built in the west, they would put a fort around the town. It would surround the town so the Indians couldn't get in. And then all the people would live in the center. And then inside were all the people. Application is surrounding both sides, all sides, and inserting in the center. When you do that, it'll bring around your but now moments. That's the only way that will bring but now moments. What are but now moments? Times of change. Times of change. So do you have but now moments in life or do you have now what moments in life? Living a life embedded in Christ through the mental and physical activity of hearing, obeying, and applying, you're going to like this, creates a whole new elemental value, chemical change, molecular change, to you, to who Christ is, and what he has done. Radical cell transformation. It's the only way you become delivered from the things that you have in you that are holding you back from understanding the truth about who Christ is. It's why you will never shed the things that you are trying to shed. Because you have not had a but now moment. Which is a time of change. Because you've never surrounded yourself and inwardly inserted the word of God in the proper prepositional position where it belongs in your life. the only way things will change with you. The only way. Teenagers, you need to be listening to this because you guys are going to have issues in your life and you're going to wonder how to fix them. And if you just miss this message, I'm telling you, but now moments will be hard to find. But now, surrounded, inserted, applied correctly, life will never be the same. Amen. Life will never be the same. So you're probably wondering what the word was. I can't remember now. Shades. <laughs> I'll pick one. Actually, no. The word was listen. The word was listen. I said it a lot. Listen. God's been speaking that word to me for the last month. They need to listen. 99% of the, the reason people are still where they're at is because we have stopped listening. We have stopped listening. We hear. But again, I love it when my mother used to, you know, do this. And say, are you hearing me? And I'm going, yeah. And it's going, Phew. And see, we don't need to hear the word of God. We need to listen to the word of God. We need to let it go in, jiggle around, go up here, ferment our mind so that we know what it's saying, and then on we go. It is Communion Sunday, I'm sorry, but I had to run over a little bit. So let's bow our heads and close our eyes real quick. Father God, we come before you, Lord.
And Father, we thank you. <coughs> you know, maybe there's some of you in this church today that have never had a button now moment. One of the first things to start a button now moment is receiving Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. It's easy. It's just saying a simple prayer. Father God, come into my heart. Save me, Lord. Forgive me of my sin nature. Allow me to walk in who you have called me to be. It's that easy. Once you do that, your temple, your heart, is filled with the Lord. He begins to take up a residence there. And in that residence, your life will begin to change. Right? It doesn't happen overnight. It's a process of the process. But it first comes from receiving Jesus Christ. That simple prayer, Lord, come into my heart, save me, forgive me, I'm a sinner. Now, with every head bowed and every eye closed, if you said that prayer, if you asked Christ to be a part of your life, then what I would ask you to do, just to make a public proclamation, nobody's looking, it's just me, is to just lift up your hand real quick and put it back down if you've received Jesus Christ. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I've only got to do it once. Many hands going up in the air. It's that but now moment. It's that but now moment. But now you are hid in Christ. Amen. Amen. But now you are a child <laughs> of the King. But now sin has no dominion over you. So, Father, you've seen the hands. I thank you for those hands, Father. Now, Lord, I know there are people in this room. I know that have said God's got it, but they've never given it. And so, Father, I'm asking, Lord, that you would quicken them today, Lord, to absolutely, 100%, unequivocally, let go. Let go and never take it back. Because, Father, I know that you have called these people to an abundant life. And abundance isn't found in struggling with something. There is no abundance in struggle. There is abundance in freedom. And freedom comes at the foot of the cross. So Father, allow them to lay it down and walk away. I know there are people in this room that need to lay it down and walk away. Trust God. It will be a but now moment for you. And never go back. Father God, we love you, Lord Jesus Christ. And we are asking, Father, that you would just bless us, Father. Speak to our hearts, Father, throughout the week, Lord. Allow this message to ring firmly through our minds, Father. Bring us to this place, Father, where we can absolutely, 100%, trust you in all things. Father, because we are hid in you, and that gives us a place of honor and authority. So, Father, we thank you, love you, and praise you, Lord. In your precious name we pray, Father. Amen. Amen. So, we want to do that or we want to.